Okay, good morning and welcome back. Today I am continuing chapter 15, the microbial mechanisms of pathogenicity, particularly with section three, virulence factors of bacterial and viral pathogens. Switch over to here, whoops, to here, there we go. All right, learning objectives, explain how virulence factors contribute to signs and symptoms of infectious disease, Differentiate between endotoxins and exotoxins. That one's pretty straightforward. Describe and differentiate between various types of exotoxins. Describe the mechanisms for viruses, use of for adhesion and antigenic variation. Okay, virulence factors. So these are virulence, this is a table of virulence factors for adhesion. Uh, so some of the things that you're commonly familiar with here Streptococcus pyogenes, which causes strep throat. It uses protein F, and it attaches to respiratory epithelial cells. Streptococcus mutans, that's the agent that's mostly responsible for cavities. See, they all have different kinds of adhesins. Neisseria gonorrhea uses the type 4 pili, and they all have uh, their particular targets too. So using some fembre, or some m methyl phenylalanine pili. Virulence factors for invasions. So exoenzymes and toxins. The bloodstream is uh, a great place to put your toxin because you have access to nearly all cells. The disadvantage is that you have numerous immune system elements floating around in the bloodstream as well. Bacteremia is the presence of bacteria in blood. When the bacteria involved are specifically pyogens or pus forming bacteria, it's pyemia. Viremia, as you can imagine, is viruses in the blood, toxemia, toxins in the blood, septicemia. That's when bacteria are not only present in the blood, but they are also multiplying. Patients with septicemia are described as septic. You've heard that before, I'm sure because septicemia can readily lead to shock in which the systolic pressure drops below 90. All right, part three of our clinical focus. Presence of bacteria in Michael's blood is a sign of infection since blood is normally sterile. No indication that the bacteria entered the blood through an injury. Instead, it appears it was gastrointestinal. Uh, let's see. So using data they gathered from the, um, well, from the family and who ate what. So Michael was the only one that ate the hot dogs. So listeriosis is uh, what is suspected. Listeria monocytogenes, the facultative intracellular pathogen that causes listeriosis. It's a common contaminant in ready to eat foods, such as lunch meats and dairy products. You know why? <laughs> and it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be if we would accept gamma irradiation as uh, you know, the safe procedure that it is that would allow your lunch meats to be pretty darn free of uh, listeria or any other bacteria. Anyway, um, we don't have that, uh, or we do, but um, consumers reject it because of the mandatory labeling. That's the issue with GMO labeling too, uh, and that's a separate discussion. Anyway, Listeriosis is fatal in about 1 in 5 normal healthy people, so it's about 20%. Mortality rates are higher in patients with pre-existing conditions with uh, that weakened immune response. This is That's pretty much universal. So a uh, cluster of virulence genes encoded on a pathogenicity island is responsible for the pathogenicity of listeria monocytogenes. So that's that term, pathogen... I can't... Sorry. I can't highlight uh, with this. That would have been useful there. The pathogenicity island, that's uh, what we refer to that cluster of, well, it says it in the sentence, the cluster of virulence genes uh, that are on a pathogenicity island. That's a common theme in a lot of uh, pathogens, especially particularly virulent ones, or primary ones, more so than uh, secondary ones, or opportunistic. All right, so there's a toxin. Um, Okay, here we go. Sorry. Uh, these genes are regulated by a transcriptional factor known as peptide chain release factor 1, PRFA. One of the genes regulated 
by PRFA is HYL. So again, I think I mentioned it in passing, in case you hadn't heard this before, when we refer to genes, we're using the three letter code and, uh, whoops, I did it again. Three letter code that is italicized. And then when we talk about the protein product, oh, okay, let's pull them back. We're talking about the protein product of a gene. Uh, you know, we're using the uh, shortened version here, but you capitalize it and you do not italicize. Okay, so the toxin that gets encoded is LLO, listeriol lysin. That allows the bacterium to escape uh, vacuoles in the host cell. Second gene regulated by PRFA is ACTA. So, of course, uh, transcriptional factors, gene regulation, right? And uh, that ACTA act uh, encodes surface protein known as actin assembling inducing protein. So act A, right? So that's the gene and then the protein, right? Is expressed on the surface of listeria and polymerizes host actin. This enables the bacterium to produce actin tails, move around the cell cytoplasm, spread from cell to cell without exiting into the extracellular compartment. All right, so Michael's condition has begun to worsen, now experiencing a stiff neck and hemiparesis, weakening in one side of the body. Concerned that the infection is spreading, the physician decides to conduct additional tests to determine what is causing these new symptoms. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is where, you, sorry, we're getting ready to talk about, we're talking about some um, toxins still. But um, I think after referring an endotoxin, such swelling can occur when gram negative engulfed by phagocytes release tumor necrotic factors, uh, TNFs, which bind capillaries, increasing the permeability, allowing fluid to escape the bloodstream and inner tissue. But we're still talking about exoenzymes. So Staph aureus. Uh, using hyaluronidase S is able to degrade hyaluronic acid that cement cells together so that it can get access, right? A little easier. Nucleases, so Staph aureus again with the DNAs, degrades the DNA released by dying cells, uh, thus promoting spread. Phospholipases, bacillus anthracis is able to degrade phospholipid bilayer of host cells, um, so obviously causing cellular lysis degrading the membrane of the phagosome to enable escape into the cytoplasm. And then proteases, an example of which include the collagenase and clostridium perfringens, degrades the collagen and connective tissue to promote the spread. So anyway, uh, any of these exoenzymes are able to facilitate invasion or support their own growth uh, or defend against the immune system. Here's a cartoon for that. So holding these cells together, hyaluronin, and then bacteria able to degrade that are able to now pass between the cells. So DNAs, um, so degrade DNA as a means of escaping and spreading. Uh, these are uh, all things that were in that table. So the phospholipases, specific to types of phospholipid and action of cleavage, and then proteases uh, include collagenase. If you make your own cheese, you need to get some proteases uh, of your own. <laughs> I haven't done that in a while. I should do that again. Okay, so here's an illustration. Um, again, collagenase, um, able to get access to uh, the dense, through the dense connective tissue. So toxins, another type of, uh, another virulence factor. So this is a biological poison that assists in invasion and causing damage. The toxigenicity the ability of a pathogen to produce a toxin. Now, how toxic a particular biological poison is, is of course in a function in part of its concentration, right? And the uh, dose and the location and all these other factors. Just because something is a toxin doesn't mean it necessarily causes um, a lot, well, mortality in, in one example. So that's why they have an LD50 for toxins. And uh, I think we go over some of that here in a bit. So endotoxins, these are uh, molecules that are released by the pathogen upon its death. Um, so lipopolysaccharide, lipid A is toxic. 
it will induce an inflammatory response that's similar to tumor necrosis factor to TNF. Those are endotoxins. When the cells get destroyed um, by the immune system or whatever, they are now releasing these toxins. So remember what our LPS composition looked like. We had the lipid A, then we have the core, and then the uh, O antigen. It is the uh, lipid A is the toxic component. So toxins, so endotox exotoxins are mostly from gram positive organisms and they are very specific in their action. So these are things that are secreted rather than things that are internal that become toxic upon release. So, uh, or we're comparing endotoxins and exotoxins here. So gram positive uh, primarily, but gram negative can have exotoxins. They're mostly proteins. Uh, they uh, induce specific damage to, um, to cells. It's dependent upon receptor mediated targeting of cells and specific mechanisms of action. That's, you know, it's a protein, it's, it's a very specific action. Most are heat labile, uh, so they can be denatured relatively readily, but some are heat stable and they have a low LD50 on their own. So it takes less of it to kill half of the people that have that much of it. And whereas on the endotoxin, uh, they have a high LD50, they're heat stable, and uh, generally it's only their general uh, signs and symptoms they cause, like inflammation, fever. Here's some examples. So uh, cholera toxin uh, caused by, well, Vibrio cholera. These are intracellular targeting toxins. And uh, cholera toxin works by activation of adenyl cyclase and in intestinal cells, causing increased levels of CAMP, cyclic AMP, secretion of fluids and electrolytes out of the cells, causing diarrhea. Tetanus toxin, which again was in the news, um, was that real recently? Or is that from a case from a couple of years ago that just got it? A final judgment in it where the kid with tetanus the parents still refused to vaccinate and um, he survived uh, but it took like it was like eight hundred thousand dollars in bills uh, for the parents botulinum toxin uh, so botulinum toxin especially if you had animal fish you've gone over this probably by now it will inhibit the release of acetylcholine from neurons causing flaccid paralysis. Now there's another descriptor that goes with flaccid paralysis in connection with botulinum toxin, and that is permanent flaccid paralysis. The binding of the botulinum toxin component that does the binding, and I'll talk about the two fact, oh, I'm going to uh, shortly talk about that anyway. Uh, that's not a reversible uh, connection there. Okay, so then as a group, we have our membrane disrupting toxins, our streptolysins, pneumolysins, so alpha toxins, phospholipase C, beta toxins. So all things that will, uh, so the lysins up here, these are kind of interesting because they'll assemble into a pore uh, in the cell membrane, which will kill the cell if you stick a pore in it. And then uh, these other ones are less uh, efficient maybe. I mean, that's a stretch. I don't actually know that that's the case. But uh, anyway, these will degrade the cell membrane phospholipids. And then we have our super antigens. So toxic shock syndrome being one of those. And uh, that's staph aureus. So it stimulates uh, excessive activation of the immune system cells and the release of cytokines from immune system cells. Life-threatening fever, inflammation, and shock are the result. So you have a streptococcus uh, mitogenic exotoxin and streptococcal pyrogenic uh, toxins as well. There's some examples, common exotoxins. So intracellular targeting toxins that are of an AB type of, uh, well, they're AB toxins. Uh, the B component is the one that will bind the extracellular receptor that will uh, induce uh, endocytosis. And then uh, once endocytosed, the active component, the A component, the active component will be separated and uh, it will gain access to the cytoplasm. Those are intracellular targeting toxins. And some examples, um, well, this is from the other table, right? So more detail here, cholera toxin is an enterotoxin uh, produced by Vibrio cholera. 
It has one A subunit and five B subunits. B subunits bind to receptors on intestinal epithelial cells after entry. A activates intracellular G proteins, activating adenyl cyclase, so that's increasing the cyclic AMP, causing ex excessive secretion and resulting in the rice water stool diarrhea. Now diphtheria toxin, wait a second. Okay, yeah, corineobacterium diphtheria. Here we are, we're down here. Here we go. Uh, so the diphtheria toxin um, inhibits protein synthesis, the A subunit. So again, the B subunit is on the outside. Uh, it binds, and then the A, is elongation factor two, what? Oh, the A subunit <laughs> inactivates elongation factor two by transferring in ADP ribose. This stops protein elongation, inhibiting protein synthesis, and killing the cell. That's in diphtheria. Now, botulinum toxin is the most acutely lethal toxin known, uh, period, uh, with an estimated human medial lethal dose of 1.3 to 2.1 nanograms, not mil nanograms per kilogram of body weight, when it's delivered intravenously or intramuscularly. Uh, it's about tenfold that when inhaled. A little bit less than that. Nanograms per kilograms. So it has a light A subunit, a heavy B. Uh, the B binds the neuron, allowing entry into the neuromuscular junction. A, uh, for A, as a protease, cleaves the protein involved in acetylcholine release. Permanent flaccid paralysis. And yes, this would have been more fun in person, but that's okay. Uh, this exists. Uh, Scrotox is what it's called. And Google it. Uh, you don't have to believe me. You can just uh, Google it and you'll see, um, you know, sure, why not? Some men want smoother uh, scrotums. I, I would think they would be looser as well, lose the ability to tighten up in response to cold. But yeah, that's where we're at. That's where we're at. It's, it's, this was 2016. This is post-2016 world where... Botox in the penis. I mean, in the scrotum. All right. Tetanus toxin has a light A, heavy B chain. Uh, it binds inhibitory interneurons like glycine, GABA, inhibit uh, acetylcholine from the inhibitory neurons, which uh, causes permanent muscle contractions, typically culminates with respiratory failure and death. Oh, and this is, wait, wait, was this from Goop? I forgot. I think it might be, but I can't swear to that right now. Um, it looks like the font. I think this is from Goop, right? That was kind of my theme of sort of the whole time is to point out some really terrible things from Gwyneth Paltrow's site. All right, so according to them, this is not the right answer. Okay, this is not what you do. But if you read this website and you're a devotee, uh, you might think that this is what you do. So clean the wound and uh, allow the wound to bleed to help remove debris, introduce oxygen, which will kill the tetanus bacteria. Some doctors suggest using hydrogen peroxide, but washing out with clean running water and soap can be just as effective. And you can also use colloidal silver. Um, if we're if we're in the post-apocalyptic world and we don't have vaccines anymore available and we don't have medicine or antibiotics anymore. I, this is what you're left with, I guess. Uh, there's parts of the world where you could find yourself where you don't have access to any of that. And then this is all you have left, and this is what you'd have to do. And just hope it doesn't kill you uh, horribly. I mean, even the contractions, the continuous contractions because of the inhibition of the inhibitory interneurons uh, can break bones. Okay, so here's the cartoon for botulinum toxin. Um, well, okay, it's not that detailed, but anyway, botulinum toxin blocks the release of acetylcholine. So it, it works on inside the neuron here at the neuromuscular junction, and it prevents this fusion from happening at all, uh, forever for that particular neuron. And then tetanus toxin, so here's, a, okay, this is good, the comparison here, here's an inhibitory interneuron that would normally uh, prevent this from firing a whole bunch now, instead, this NMJ will fire and contract uh, continuously. Where am I at now? 
There we are. Okay, good. So other exotoxins, uh, membrane disrupting toxins. Remember the, the ones I mentioned from Streptococcus pyogenes that are able to degrade membranes by forming pores, the hemolysins, uh, leukocytins, uh, superantigen. So those were the nonspecific uh, that would cause toxic shock syndrome. And uh, so toxic shock syndrome is mostly associated with vaginal colonization. Most of you, I didn't need to tell you that. You've probably already heard of that in the context of uh, like tampon use, right? If you leave it in too long, uh, apparently that's the risk. One of the risks is colonization by bacteria that probably rode the tampon on the way in and uh, could cause toxic shock syndrome. But I'm not that kind of doctor, so. All right, Vir virulence factors for survival and host and immune evasion. So this is the other, these are the defenses uh, instead of the uh, uh, weapons of the pathogens. So capsulation and capsulation for one, there's a cartoon for that. If it has a capsule, the antibody can't um, bind to the antigen, so it can't recognize the pathogen. And uh, this results in the, see, and then the, the, the pathogen also has a protease that can break down antibodies. So, yeah. So passive, again, the capsule, just resist recognition. You just you can't be detected. Like mycolic acids are a really good example. Then active was the protease in that cartoon to break down the antibodies. Um, also a passive defense host exploitation involving coagulase. So staph aureus uh, will cause the bacteria to get coated in fibrin, which will hide it and make it look like itself. Uh, kinases uh, that will dissolve clots so that the um, pathogen can escape any confinement that was because of a blood clot like uh, you know an abrasion or whatever and you have that bacteria introduced and they get suspended one of the functions of the um, there we go fibrin yeah one of the functions of the clot is to stop you know bacteria well some bacteria can dissolve it and move on out all right resolution Based on Michael's reported symptoms of stiff neck and hemiparesis, physicians suspect the infections may have spread to his nervous system. And that's what, uh, that's the hint from the previous clinical focus was uh, referring to the, uh, the stiff neck and, and then uh, weakness. That, that's, you know, you're basically probably headed and gone into meningitis. So what they did is a spinal tap. Um, So there's a needle is inserted and a small volume of fluid is drawn to an attached sample tube. The tube is removed, capped, prepared, labeled, uh, whatever. So you got to, yeah, whatever, stat. The preliminary results from all three departments indicate there is a cerebral spinal infection occurring with the microbiology department reporting the presence of a gram-positive rod in Michael's cerebral spinal fluid. All right, so meningitis, acute inflammation of the membranes that protect the brain and spinal cord. Uh, because it can be life-threatening, he's prescribed a, uh, an aggressive course of two antibiotics together to be delivered intravenously. Michael remains in the hospital for several days for supportive care for and for observation. After a week, he's allowed to return home and uh, fully recover uh, on bed rest or on antibiotics. All right. So antigenic variation. This is the issue with uh, when we talk about influenza. And um, this phenomenon called antigenic shift. So in this cartoon, we're looking at the neuraminidase and hemagglutinin. And again, that's the N and the H and the H, well, H and the N, like H1N1 uh, and all the related ones. So if the hemagglutinin changes uh, between hosts, then uh, any antibodies that were raised that recognize this like H1, hemagglutinin would not recognize the H2 hemagglutinin is the idea. And you can also uh, acquire the, um, and this is when they talk about a, a virus crossing species or whatnot. They have two viruses in the same host that are vaguely related. One might pick up uh, the neuraminidase from one virus, the hemagglutinin from the other virus, like if both 
uh, have penetrated the same cell, for example. In repackaging uh, both of these viruses, you might basically make a new virus. Now, a lot of the times I expect these virons, when this happens, the virons fail and they don't produce a functional virus. But once in a while they do, and then you get, like in this cartoon, it's half one, half the other. And so now you have um, a very dramatic antigenic shift, whereas minor changes uh, within the same virus and subsequent iterations or generations would be just antigenic drift. So drift and shift, right? Yeah, here we go. Influenza pandemics can often be traced to antigenic shifts. All right, so section four virulence factors of eukaryotic pathogens. So here we're looking at virulence factors unique to fungi and parasites, comparing virulence factors of fungi and bacteria, explain the difference between protozoan parasites and helminths, describe how helminths evade uh, the host immune system. All right, so fungal virulence factors. In candida, they have adhesins, surface glycoproteins, so they can stick proteases, phospholipases, uh, including keratin degradation. We have cryptococcus that has capsule production. And then fungal exotoxins, uh, of course, we call them mycotoxins instead. And uh, claviceps purpurea produces ergotoxin, causes ergoism, uh, gangrenous and convulsive. That's not pretty, obviously. I don't know if I have pictures of that later on. For, okay, so protozoan virulence. Here's some examples in Giardia lamblia. Remember the infectious dose 50% was one for that. Uses a large adhesive disc composed of microtubes to attach to the intestinal mucosa. Uh, works as a suction cup. Well, that's a fun adaptation. Plasmodium falciparum. Remember, um, causes malaria. It uses antigenic variation. Uh, these are some of the challenges that have made in creating this vaccine, which doesn't have a great efficacy. Um, antigenic variation definitely is part of that challenge set. Has an adhesin, which gets expressed on the surface of infected urethrocytes, causing clumping. Helminth virulence, so uh, Schistosoma mansoni. It's able to penetrate intact skin with the aid of proteases that degrade skin proteins like elastins and is able to degrade host antibodies. Large worms are, and so in part, it's just their freaking size um, and the fact that they have a tough cuticle. If you did the Ascaris digestion in zoology, uh, think of that kind of cuticle, right? It can just sort of bore its way through and your immune system is gonna have a really hard time with that. So uh, glycans expressed it externally and some helminths uh, will mimic hosts. This is glycan mimicry. So again, more um, masquerading as self cells to avoid the immune system. That brings us to the end of chapter 15. I think I might as well go on into chapter 16 where we talk more formally about diseases and um, epidemiology, the study of how diseases are spread. Yeah, we'll do that. That means we'll probably going to breeze through the uh, innate and adaptive immune system somewhat because you're getting that already in cell uh, at a higher level of detail anyway. But uh, I don't know about that yet. Anyway, disease and epidemiology, you're not going to get this in cell or an animal fizz or probably anywhere else until you take up like a public health course explicitly so um this isn't just my opinion but uh i think this is the basic reality when you consider epidemiology public health is a key function of government governments if you're going to have a government at all public health needs to be one of its key functions and uh you know well in this introduction we're looking at the biohazard sign, right? A few short centuries ago, people lacked a basic understanding of how diseases spread. And microbiology has greatly contributed to the field of epidemiology, which focuses on containing the spread of disease, which is a key function of government as part of public health. Okay, some of the terminologies, uh, how an introduction to how infectious diseases are tracked, 
modes of disease transmission, and then uh, global public health. Let me see. I think we're only, I'm probably only going to do section one today. Or maybe we'll come back and do that. I don't know. All right. Explain the difference between prevalence and incidence of disease. Uh, distinguish the characteristics of sporadic, epidemic, endemic, and pandemic diseases. Explain the use of Koch's postulates and their modifications to determine the etiology of disease. Explain the relationship between epidemiology and public health. All right, here's our clinical focus. Late November and early December, a hospital in Western Florida started to see a spike in the number of cases of acute gastroenteritis-like symptoms. Patients began arriving at the emergency department complaining of excessive bouts of emesis. 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 I, I just want to put an N or something in there. Emesis. Emesis. Vomiting and diarrhea, uh, but without blood. They also complained of abdominal pain and cramping, and most were severely dehydrated. Alarmed by the number of cases, hospital staff made some calls and learned that other regional hospitals were also seeing 10 to 20 similar cases per day. Epidemiology. So concerns the geographical distribution and timing of infectious disease uh, occurrences and how they are transmitted and maintained in nature with the goal of recognizing and controlling outbreaks. This includes etiology, which is the study of the causes of disease, and uh, so investigation of disease transmission is included in etiology, operates at the level of the population rather than the individual, peoples specifically at risk for the disease condition. Morbidity is the state of being diseased. Total morbidity is the number of diseased individual. Uh, disease individuals, morbidity rate, is the number of diseased individuals with reference to a total population. So usually expressed as, you know, X per 100,000 or percent. But per 100,000 is uh, pretty common. So prevalence. Um, the proportion of individuals with illness in a given population at a point in time. So when we're talking about endemic diseases in particular, or diseases that are known to persist within a population over you know, generations or over longer periods of time. So that's the prevalence of the disease when we're talking about morbidity and the incidence, uh, number or proportion of new cases in a period of time. Mortality is death, um, also quantified by rate or total numbers. Okay, so this graph compares the incidence of HIV, number of new cases reported each year, with the prevalence, total number of cases each year. Prevalence and incidence can also be expressed as a rate uh, proportional. So here we're looking at new HIV infections. Most of you won't remember, and I barely do because Reagan really sucked at um, doing something about it. But through the 80s, uh, it peaked up, um, and then, uh, you know, all the way through most of the latter 20th century, right? And then here, new HIV infections are still kind of low. But if we look at the active HIV AIDS infections, so we go up as you would expect, and then you kind of level out up here. Um, i give you a minute to figure out why that is. So we weren't fixing anybody here um, until late in this, uh, late in the 90s, I think is when the antiviral therapy really came online to be useful. But so while you're increasing in number of cases here, your uh, slope isn't as high and then it flattens out for a period of what, almost 10 years total. And that's because people were dying, right? Your number of cases stayed about the same because uh, even as you were continuing to accumulate new HIV infections, because people with HIV were dying of AIDS. And then once that antiviral therapy um, is shown to be efficacious, you see since, especially since 2000, the number of uh, active HIV AIDS infections continues to rise uh, because they're not dying. So patterns of incidence. Um, 
So there are different ways uh, these things can appear and be spread. So we have sporadic diseases. Those are ones that are seen occasionally, uh, usually without geographic concentration. So tetanus, rabies, plague, what these all have in common is that they don't, um, well, they're, they're not spread person to person at all anyway, but they also, uh, so rabies and plague have animal carriers. Tetanus is in the soil. So they're in the environment uh, without humans. You would still have these pathogens, reservoirs of these pathogens in the environment. So endemic diseases, these are constantly present, often at low levels in a population within a particular region. Epidemic is uh, basically when you have an endemic disease. Okay, no, not necessarily endemic, but when you have a larger than expected number of cases in a short time within a region. So influenza, especially in some years. And then if uh, on a larger scale, we reach pandemic or the epidemic is on a global scale like HIV. So again, uh, I think I might have shown you this before. Histoplasmosis, if you're not from this region um, and you've been here for long enough, you, uh, you've probably been exposed to histoplasmosis. It's common everywhere. If you're outside of these regions, the only way you tend to get exposed to histoplasmosis is uh, to the histoplasm capsulatum organism. Uh, the fungus is, um, you know, if you're really digging in and playing in the dirt a lot, you really have to go out of your way to get um, exposed. So when you breathe it in, let's see, the hyphae produce uh, macroconidia and microconidia. Spores that are aerosolized and dispersed, the microconidia are inhaled, and the warmer temperature inside the host signals a transformation to an oval budding yeast. The yeast are phagocytosed by immune cells and transported to regional lymph nodes. From there, uh, they travel the blood and then to other parts of the body. It can cause an infection. But um, yeah, about 80% of the population, particularly in the highly endemic region, is carrying this uh, in our lungs, and I'm sure I do too. All right, so here's an example of a, um, this was for an influenza-like uh, symptoms. So we have to say influenza-like because these are reported that could be influenza, but they're not all proven to be influenza. But here's an example of when something that goes uh, from being kind of endemic to being a, an epidemic. So 0708 saw a large spike in percentage of visits attributable to influenza-like illness. And then there's the other years there. So yeah. Here's the percentage of all deaths due to influenza and pneumonia. So the blue curve is the seasonal epidemic threshold. So we expect at um, in winter-ish, whatever, is flu season, that's where we expect to have more cases. So even with a mortality rate that is following that trend, this isn't something we're calling an epidemic. But uh, when actual mortality spikes above it, the epidemic threshold is when we label it as such. We've had some really high spikes in recent years uh, too, right? Okay, part two. Um, hospital physicians suspect that some type of food poisoning was to blame for the sudden post-Thanksgiving outbreak of gastroenteritis. <clears throat> Yikes. Okay. Uh, in Western Florida, over two-week period, 254 cases were observed. By the end of the first week of December, academic ceased uh, just as quickly as it has started. So, um, based on sampling, they found it was salmonella. And uh, there have been three confirmed deaths. In each, the patient had not sought medical care until their symptoms were severe. <clears throat> All right, so what could be causing this? So you had this outbreak over a two-week period with a bunch of cases, and then suddenly it dropped off. Hmm. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to call it here. And uh, we are going to pick it up with etiology on Wednesday. So uh, have a good rest of your day, I guess. I'm going to have 
I don't know if the kids are going to come to class with me on Wednesday or Friday. They'll probably come one of the days, but hopefully they won't cause any issues. All right. Okay. So uh, you'll see them then. All right. So until then, oh, you're right. I got to finish grading those midterms. Okay. I'm going to do that next. Uh, until 